Well, I'm Larry Stutzream. I go by Stutz, and I'm the director of research at the Mitchell Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first panel. And it's that first tenet, denying first mover advantage. Uh, and we've heard a lot about that already, but I will remind you that in 2017, it was John Hyten that uh, said we'd no longer be in the business of building uh, fat, juicy targets on orbit. Uh, and last year, uh, General Saltzman, as we heard earlier, he went full throttle on this. And when he made uh, denying first mover advantage a key tenet or component of competitive endurance. So the fa Space Force, as we all know, is making remarkable progress, shifting toward a resilient, proliferated space architecture that doesn't involve more satellites in LEO, but also explores new satellite concepts and ways of making tactically responsive space a reality. So today we're joined by representatives from the Space Force acquisition organizations who are aggressively working these transformation, these transformations, and also industry leaders delivering new capabilities to get them there. So, Again, this year, we are thrilled to have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Derek Tournier, Director of the Space Development Agency. And uh, he's been with us for all three of our, our uh, forums, but we've always had him as a lunch speaker, so we moved him up early because he was losing some weight. <laughs> so if, if, if you see him heads down in a plate later, just leave him alone. <laughs> Welcome, Derek. Thank you. Uh, next, we have, uh, Colonel, uh, er, we have Colonel Scott uh, Klempner from Space Systems Command, and he's the Deputy Program Executive Officer for Space Domain Awareness and, and Combat Power. And then from industry, we have to Derek's left, Joe Lorienti, CEO of Ursa Major. And then we have Jonathan Caldwell, Vice President and Deputy General Manager of National Security Space, Lockheed Martin. So welcome to our panel. Really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's precious. Uh, to be here. So let's start right away and get into some questions. Uh, and we'll start with the news that splashed recently um, related to space-based weapons and the implication of what just happened recently for having a first mover advantage. Uh, various government officials uh, revealed that Russia is planning a new anti-satellite weapon. Now we don't know the specifics about the threat, but the report certainly raises the heat on concerns about the extent to which adversaries might pursue, pursue ways that could eliminate the U.S. space advantage. So for the panel, I want to start with this first question is, what options does the Space Force have to mitigate the range of threats posed by uh, folks like Russia and China? And how does this factor into your thinking about deterrence? And Dr. Tornier, let's start with you first. No, thank you. And uh, see, Joe also got the note about the footwear today. So for those of you that didn't, but no, that's good. So uh, yeah, thank you for that. And, and I, I won't go into any specific threats. I actually think that General Saltzman uh, gave some, some, some good uh, remarks on that earlier today. He went into some specifics about, about how we, we deal with that. But in, in general, right, in general, I think it is exactly what, what General Hyten was, was talking about in 2017. And now we've, we've shown is, is actually possible. And that is you can defeat, or at least uh, in General Saltzman's words, right, make yourself more resilient to a large section of the threat base through proliferation. And that's how you get a lot of resilience. So uh, from that aspect, that gives, you, that gives you deterrence because now that they know you, you are resilient to a large class of, of attacks. And more importantly than that, you have deterrence because you can't uh, be taken out essentially on day zero with a with a single uh, event. So one of the a, a single attack. So one of the one of the beauties of proliferation is you can have some attrition and you can have a, a graceful degradation if you go into this kind of one on one type of uh, attack vectors. And so that's one of the things that proliferation gives you for resilience and for deterrence. Now, as I've always mentioned, that only works when you don't have common mode failures. So the two biggest threats that I'm concerned with today and, and in, the, you know, in, the, in the future until I see something that, that leads me to believe that the threats, there's, there's more pressing threats. The two threats I'm most concerned with 
are cyber vulnerabilities and supply chain. Supply chain either interdiction or just the supply chain availability to be able to build and proliferate at the scale and the, the time frame we need. So be it because of that, we take extreme measures uh, on all of our contracts and all of our ground systems to make sure that we have a lot of cyber protections in place. In fact, we have one of the, uh, our cyber uh, protection strategy is now used as a model across most of the rest of the space force on how cyber security should be done in a proliferated architecture. So that's how I, I view it as playing out. You know, most of the threats we can make ourselves resilient against and we can deter the adversary from using just by proliferation. For those that we can't, that are common mode, we, that's where we focus our energy to make sure we protect against those. Thank you. We'll slide down the line, Joe. Uh, that's a fantastic answer. From, from the perspective of our company, Building Propulsion, We'd love to say this is a, a deterrence by production problem, but we know that uh, we know that uh, replenishment is not the solution here. So we think about avoidance. We think about um, detection and maneuvering on orbit as as solutions here. And uh, General Saltzman touched on the tac tactically responsive launch demonstration of Victus Knox. It's a fantastic demonstration to to show that there are. Uh, avoidance and replenishment capabilities that aren't necessarily um, mass production efforts. So this is more a, a technical problem than a, uh, a strategic or a scale problem in our mind. So proliferation, I think, is the best way to make your architectures and capabilities resilient. However, in the near term, through the end of the 2020s, we are going to have to fight with the architecture we have. Space Systems Command operates a large number of legacy high value assets, the large juicy targets, we got them all. Uh, and we're actually, we're not done fielding them. So no re disrespect to General Hyten, but there are a couple, you know, the last of the HBAs are gonna be launched through the end of this decade and into the 2030s. And there are budget reality as, as to why that's the case. Um, I think the best way to think about deterrence uh, with respect to making it so that the, an attack on a spacecraft uh, is not successful is to rebalance attack and defense, re rebalance, that, rebalance that towards uh, favoring defense. Because the, the strategy is that if you attack, you win, then the, strategy, the winning strategy is to attack. Um, obviously, if we are not able to instantly proliferate, and so we will get there, even Space Systems Command is starting to proliferate its architectures uh, and following SDA's lead. Um, the thing that we need, regardless of how it is you respond, to an attack, you have to know that the first mover has actually moved. That's something that we can't necessarily do today. We can't do it consistently. Uh, the, the, the thing that's eating our lunch is being able to have persistent space domain awareness, uh, being able to see that attack with as little latency as possible, and to give ourselves as much decision space as possible to respond, whether that response is for a high value asset to do an escape maneuver or whatever else, uh, if you don't know you're under attack, it doesn't matter you know, how I end that sentence, right? So taking advantage of uh, networks we don't yet have, persistent space domain awareness capabilities that we don't yet have, and the speed of decision making that we are working very actively to develop is what we're going to need to make sure that if an attack happens, uh, that we're going to be able to respond again, however that is. Uh, all of our future HVAs are gonna have some level of onboard resilience, whether it's maneuver capability or, or other you know, layered measures. But whether we're getting attacked in our proliferated configuration or not, knowing that we are getting attacked is gonna remain a priority, making sure that we have a rapid, agile, automated network for getting data from our sensors to our command centers into a, a rapid decentralized decision-making space is gonna always be a priority. And that's probably the best thing that we can do uh, for protecting both HVAs and proliferated constellations going forward, and that's where we're gonna be spending our effort. Very good. So what can we do to make uh, any kind of attack uh, on our space systems impractical? Proliferation, connectivity. Uh, as the Colonel noted, connectivity across all of the layers. This hybrid multi-orbit architecture has to be able to talk amongst the layers so we're strong advocates of going ahead and implementing that right now in the production lines, regardless of whether it's a Pelio asset, uh, a MEO or a new proliferated MEO asset, or one of the GEO assets, uh, or even beyond GEO. Uh, an important point, attribution, right? I think we've seen in Ukraine that one of the power 
uh, one of the powers of the space was being able to unveil what's actually happening. And the idea that we're going to move into an era where all space platforms have some form of self-awareness and neighborhood awareness, and that we have systems that are both classified and that are commercial that we can offer and show two speeds, what's going on and how can we expose that uh, um, bad actor to the rest of the world so the rest of the world can take action. Uh, and I think that's a practical reality. You know, it used to be a day when you, your car didn't come with a backup camera or a, a sensor. Uh, and then there was a time where you had to, the salesman would try to sell you whether that's a feature. And today I was going out shopping for the next car for the family. And you can hardly find a car that doesn't have that kind of self-awareness feature in it. And I think much like the auto industry, the space industry is going to come to see that as a natural part of any space system that gets offered out. Uh, and finally, a reconstitution. Um, if there's no point, there's no point in attacking if you can simply reconstitute the capability. And I think industry owes it uh, to our customers to demonstrate this of our own volition without waiting to be asked. So following the footsteps of Victus Knox, Lockheed Martin launched our own uh, sat uh, satellite in December called Tantrum. Now what you did know is I actually used the SDA's production line. I had a transport layer T0 contract. So I had a production line going, so I was able to pull a bus off, put a, a wideband electronically steerable sensing array, and launch a, a sensing satellite, get it operational in 72 hours, and collect the electromagnetic spectrum uh, and offer that data to customers. I think that's a demonstration of commitment, of industrial commitment to tactically responsive space that ought to give our adversaries pause and say it's, it's an inherent capability of industry, not, not just something that happens when the government takes action. Very good, uh, great discussion. I, I wanna pivot a bit and uh, you know, when, talk about one of the great hallmarks of US strategy is always how we engage our, our partners across the planet. And, uh, and, and so engaging them, uh, where, does, where are we at with that in terms of denying a first mover advantage? And I'd, I'd like to ask Joe to start this and then open it up to the panel. I'm probably not the right one to answer where we are at. Sure. I'm probably not the right one to answer where we are at broadly uh, as an industry, but kind of speaking for the non-traditional contractor up here on the stage, uh, it, it's, it's become clear that there are extreme advantages that we can create with uh, our foreign allies, especially in the space domain, where uh, many of the problems are deeply technical. These are, these are ways for us to diversify our, our capabilities on orbit, and uh, it, it's extremely difficult for a company like Ursa Major to work overseas. Um, we've, we've worked on the policy side to try to improve that. We've worked... Um, directly via the commercial means, which is the most accessible route uh, to, to us partnering with a, an allied force. But the, the headache that we face right now is that there is no kind of clear policy path to a partnership that is enduring and a partnership that is really meaningful. We, we may be able to, uh, after weeks, months of approval process, uh, find the right commercial interaction. But for more strategic capabilities, for more, more of the uh, needs that we have on orbit today, there, there really is not a clear path to a non-traditional uh, with our resources, with our limited time, with our limited headcount to be able to partner overseas. Uh, we, we see this as, as a huge need, especially when you think about what's talked about just about every day now is this, uh, this kill web in the Western Pacific. This is, this is an area for us to really partner with our allied forces overseas, uh, build a strength uh, for the coalition there in the Western Pacific that today is not being addressed. Uh, so I, I think that certainly John can probably speak to it from the perspective of, of a larger industrial player, but I, I'd love to hear the, uh, the um, government uh, con contributions on this panel there. Jonathan, before we do that. Yeah, no, I, I, trust me, I feel your pain as, as one of the larger companies in the room. Uh, it's been a real challenge uh, to expand and and engage uh, with our allies. You know, one of the things that I'm heartened by as I look around the room is our allies are here. We're having a unified conversation around this important topic today. Um, with the stand-up of space commands in Australia, in the UK, in Canada, and 
uh, other allies now standing up there, um, uh, nascent versions of space commands. You, you are individually acquiring your own sovereign space capability. No longer is it the realm of the US to provide services to your nations, but now you're engaging in acquiring your own sovereign systems. I think there's an immense power in that for both resiliency and deterrence because it brings more people to the table. What we need, especially as international industry, because I do consider Lockheed Martin an international company, uh, is the ability to more easily negotiate both the classification of the technologies that will empower our allies and then the, the international trade uh, and arms regulation, that technologies that were once in the 70s and 80s considered exquisite and the unique domain of the US and potentially Russia are now much more commonplace. So how can we more easily facilitate the right transfers of technologies or the right awareness of capabilities to the folks in this room who are eagerly seeking to step up to the plate and be a part of the global deterrence posture in space. Um, and so we, we as industry are, are eagerly seeking ways to partner in country with you and do that. And for the, for the folks on the US side, empowering industry to be out there and build out this global security architecture uh, your advocacy and your uh, consistent push on the bureaucracy to make that happen is going to be tremendously important. Sure. <clears throat> so the demand for allied collaboration and engagement and partnership for my organization is beyond what we can currently handle. Uh, we don't have, we, we're trying to find the budget to kind of keep up with the, with the pace and, and we're falling a little bit behind. Uh, we have robust cooperation for sharing uh, ballistic missile warning data, uh, capabilities that we are working to share with partners, that we're going to sell them copies of what we have, and then sharing space domain awareness data. Uh, that sharing of the space domain awareness data is probably the best way that, you know, relative to the topic, uh, that we can exploit what we have, but also exploit what they have, meaning our pet partners, whether it's Australia, UK, Japan, are going to be generating their own data that we all want to share. So the Space Systems Command developed the Allied Exchange environment. It tacks on to our unified data layer, our data library, and it becomes a way for us to create a synoptic view to where every space operations center has the same common operating picture for who's doing what in space. That is probably the most important way we can exploit, uh, grow, and nurture Allied cooperation. I just want to say one more thing here. Uh, foreign military sales, it's, a, it's run by the State Department because it's an a instrument of national policy and politics. Uh, the DoD doesn't necessarily get to say, we don't have the final say on what systems or capabilities are shared with our partners. Uh, it is you know, through, uh, you know, between Congress and State Department. But when it comes to the war in space, I think the Space Force has an opportunity to go out uh, you know, yet again uh, kind of define a new frontier here. Uh, usually, for terrestrial domains, our partners are, are worried about their own security environments. It's regional in nature, usually, uh, and, and they are solving their own problems that, in some ways, don't align with COCOM priorities. Uh, aligning those COCOM priorities, uh, you know, there's a lot of effort being spent about how to steer allies towards ways to create a shared security environment. In space, when the war happens, there's only going to be one war, and we're all going to be fighting it. And so creating a shared force structure is something that I think that we, with our spacefaring allies, can do in a way that uh, is not necessarily the way we've done it in the, in the other domains. So what does that mean? If I want 30, you know, for example, hypothetically, if I want 30 of some system, but I can only afford 10, but I have partners who, they want to buy their own version of that system, well, great, we want them to have it. But furthermore, we want to have coordinated, combined arms approach uh, for combined operations when we together you use those systems in a, in a extending the conflict, or sorry, extending the competition phase with our adversaries. That is something that I, I think it's, it's going a little bit further than we, we've done before with our allied cooperation and the other COCOMs. Not to say that it's not robust in those other COCOMs, but again, the Space Force has an opportunity here that I think we should look to, to take allied cooperation a couple steps farther because we can and we must. 
Derek, you got any? Yeah, I, uh, I find it a little uh, discouraging that both you hear up here that uh, you know, the small companies and the, the large companies are both having problems in this area. That is, that is something that, that uh, we, we need to be able to figure out how to work through because it is going to be impactful. And I'm, I'm just going to dovetail on what the Colonel said. That is, it is a unique position that the U.S. Space Force is in, if you think about it, right? The U.S. Space Force uh, is, is in charge of presenting the force for the combatant commands, primarily uh, for Space Command, which is a regional command globally, right? It's regional command, everything. That is much different than any of the other services who will present forces to a combatant command that has their terrestrial region that then they deal with those allies in that terrestrial region and work that out. So from the get-go, space command or U.S. Space Force is set up completely differently, right? It has to be international from the beginning because space doesn't, the terrestrial boundaries don't, uh, don't extend uh, vertically. You're going to be over all nations uh, at a given point point in your orbit, and you have to you have to work with that. And from that, uh, what what we've been doing to to enable that that piece of it within the Space Development Agency is making sure that whatever we put out there, we work with our allies so that they understand what it would take for them to build a system to be able to plug directly into our architecture. We publicize our optical com standards. In fact. Uh, a lot of our optical comm terminal vendors are from, from allied partners, right? So they're working very closely. The allies know about that. If they put those standards on their satellites that they own and operate, and again, then follow the Nebula networking standard, which we publish, and we actually have a test bed at Naval Research Laboratory where all of this can be, the interoperability can be demonstrated and, and worked out then we can work out the agreements on how to do the authority to connect because then we've, we've solved the physical layer aspects of it. And then it's just, uh, if, you're, if you're allies, essentially our networks are the SIPRNet in space, we call the SOPRNet is our transport layer. We can figure out a way to do an authority to connect, to connect those. Uh, to date, we've been working exceptionally well with, uh, with our allies, NATO allies in particular. Uh, that uh, we, we not only are putting ground entry points in some of their uh, in some of their countries, but also working exceptionally closely with them to do Link 16 testing in the in the future and plan for that. All of our Link 16 testing to date has been done with a Five Eyes partner, uh, not in the over over Conus. So it's already been done internationally, and we've got uh, our international partners teamed with us to demonstrate that capability. So it's something that you know, is inherently from the beginning. This is how we have to team together to make sure that we can have a coherent space network and a coherent space infrastructure. And if you want to talk to, you know, this is the way that you get rid of that first mover advantage and you actually help with deterrence. Because if everything's interconnected and you have this kind of system, then our, through our allies, we share, we share assets. So if an adversary wants to attack one, it's going to ha have to attack others. And that, that essentially puts a higher bar on, uh, on, on that ability to attack before you, you, it takes away more of that first mover advantage. So those are all the aspects that make space unique in this area. And hopefully we can push through it and, and make it easier for industry to, to engage as well. Superb discussion. So beyond making systems more resilient, uh, and this is a question we'll start with uh, Colonel Klempner uh, to begin, but... Uh, we want to talk about reconstitution and defensive operations that may be vital in what we're talking about this topic today. What steps is Space Force taking to rapidly rebuild or replace damage capabilities? So reconstitution is interesting. Uh, in my portfolio, we have the tactically responsive space effort that has come up a couple times today. And we get a lot of questions about is tactically responsive space how we reconstitute? And I think the predecessor to TACRS, what is the uh, tactically, um, the tactically responsive? Operationally responsive space. Tactically, oh. or operationally responsive space, right. And that was geared at reconstitution. And that's not where we are. That's not what TACRS is. And so when it comes, to, so we, but I'm telling you, when we've been asked the question, well, wouldn't you want to reconstitute using tactically responsive launch to plug the hole that you didn't know existed until you got attacked? No, that's not where we are. Uh, if we have satellites on a production line, we are pushing those out as fast as we can. We're gonna launch them and put them to service. We're not gonna keep things on the ground because they are better served in orbit, one, providing service to the joint force or the strategic force. Two, 
they add resiliency to the network because they add another targetable node that, that uh, further proliferates the capability. So the only way to reconstitute uh, is to keep that production line going. Uh, what we've come up with instead is our, our CASR concept, commercial augmentation space reserve, is to where if we have a need either to surge or to plug a, an exploitable gap in capability, we are looking at the contractual structures, the legal arrangements needed for us to call upon fielded commercial capability or about to be fielded commercial capability to provide those services to terrestrial forces. So that includes sensing, communications, uh, in some cases missile warning, uh, PNT. Uh, so all the things that, that if there are, are gaps that we need to even augment large holes in our proliferated constellations, those exploitable gaps are things we're gonna wanna plug as well. But Dr. Tournier is gonna have his satellites on a production line being pushed into service as fast as possible. Uh, and that is, that is how we get ahead of, of drawdown, graceful degradation in space is to keep our production lines going and to look for commercial augmentation where possible. Dr. Tournier, any thoughts? Uh, just, a, just a few, I completely agree. We're gonna be building these satellites and launching them as quickly as possible and, uh, and industry's going to, to keep that pace, right, Jonathan? Indeed. Excellent, <laughs> all right. Uh, and so You'll that, get that, that is exactly the, 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 the model is that you, 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 know, you put these up, we, we don't really worry about, uh, about being able to, to fill certain portions, have, have satellites in the barn at this time, right? That's something that, that is for consideration. If there, was, if there was a way to get ahead of production, <laughs> then we would have to relook at that because there is, there is you know, a certain class of threats that uh, I'm not gonna comment on here. I, I commented on it a couple weeks ago and I was told that my proper response, what I meant to say was no comment. So, uh, so there's, a, there's a certain class of threats that, that makes sense if you wanted to have capability in the barn uh, ready to launch. But by, uh, by all accounts, the vast majority of threats and the, and the way that you really get the resilience is just to get everything up as quickly as you can produce it and, and just keep that model, have on-orbit spares, if you will, with on-orbit resiliency. So, so let me ask the industry uh, participants here on the panel. You know, what needs to happen to the industrial base to be able to reduce that time to get satellites on orbit? So uh, I'm a big believer in diversity of supply chain. I think Derek and I have had a lot of conversations around this. One of the key elements to that production line is to have a robust industrial base. You know, we at Lockheed Martin put together a $400 million venture fund because we don't think everything can be done inside of the large companies. The there is a certain level of speed and innovation and risk that is well suited for the startup environment. And so we've gone out and looked for the right kind of companies with the right blend of people and personality to get after some of that technology development and let us focus on our own technology development and amplify uh, our effect on the industry. Uh, the reality is there's great capital money available on the, on the street today. Uh, but you have to find a way to put together willing investors to go after it and demonstrate that there's a market. Uh, and when you have a production line running, uh, then you're able to make those connections. Um, I think Derek said on cyber, I think the, the investments in cyber uh, securing and cyber hardening uh, this network, because if you step back a little bit, what we're talking about is really a vast mesh network. So how do you take the same concepts of a self-healing, self-directed mesh network and put them into our existing orbit on orbit systems. I think that connection is the first part, but then there's some underlying autonomy and infrastructure that we're investing in to offer to say, how will data find its own way? We're gonna to get to a scale where you have 10, 20, 30,000 systems on orbit where you can't have an individual operator decide how to route the network. I mean, can you imagine that's like the, the old fashioned telephone operator from the 1920s plugging faster and faster. At some point, you have to automate the system. And I think we're on the verge of making that a reality, getting people comfortable that these systems will function autonomously in the time of need and the time of crisis and at the speed we need. And so those investments and being able to demonstrate that, in fact, our, our current Pony Express 2 uh, on-orbit test bed will be one of those commercial systems. We'd love to see it come into the, uh, into the commercial uh, realm. Uh, but it's demonstrating those kinds of autonomy, flying AI instances 
to automatically route the traffic and to understand the domain in which they exist. Um, those are going to be the key things that we need to contribute uh, as industry to the overall architecture. Very good. Joe, Joe uh, I'll expand a bit on what the Colonel and John said. I think this is, uh, this is a challenge, but it's a really exciting one for industry to address within the supply chain. Uh, there's a supply chain scale question here, but a, a supply chain and a technical flexibility question as well. So uh, if we are looking to modularize some of our technologies and uh, create the ability to assemble a, a one-off sensor with a bus off of a production line with a propulsion system that might have been designed for a very different mission, uh, we have a lot of flexibility in our supply chain and in our industrial base that really hadn't existed before, especially because we're reaching a scale now that, that enables it. Tying that to what uh, John touched on on the kind of innovation and investment side, uh, exactly that flexibility is what investors like ours are looking for. Uh, if we have one mission we're trying to solve, it's very difficult to fund it between, say, TRL3 and TRL9. But if we have flexibility, if we have one technology that can, can address a field of missions, we can find private funding to advance that technology. And increasingly, there are contracts available to see that through to TRL9, uh, whereas a few years ago, that, that certainly was not the case. So uh, we, uh, we as a propulsion provider, but I think our peers as sensor providers and bus providers and prime integrators are increasingly excited about this notion that a production line can be flexible we can provide a really capable uh, node in the supply chain uh, for more than one mission. Very good. We've got a few minutes before we go to Q&A, but I, I want to, you know, we talked about proliferation, we talked about tactically responsive space, but now we need to talk about adding defensive measures and uh, thoughts about some baseline requirements with respect to that on systems going forward, of course. And I'll start with uh, the Colonel. Okay. Where to start? Um, if we're going to fight with a, with a network, we're going to fight off the network, we're going to have a network of, of data underlying everything we do. We spent 20 years of continuous war learning lessons about how do we think faster than our adversary and how do we react faster than our adversary. So no matter what it is we're going to do, like I said, no matter how I finish that sentence, there are things we're going to need to make sure that we have that network and it's running as fast as we possibly can. Uh, when we were fighting in the Middle East, it took us years to, to learn those lessons. We're not going to have years uh, in a space conflict. Uh, we are currently, we, the Space Force currently operates with legacy systems, legacy processes, and legacy mindset. There are people at, across all three current field commands getting after legacy mindset. We're trying to rehabilitate legacy systems, use them in new ways, build the future systems that, that work on top of those to get that network functioning. Now, uh, in order to, to unlock the potential of those networks, we need to make sure that we have both ground and space-based space domain awareness. Persistent SDA that can close our exploitable gaps uh, with metric ranging, low latency maneuver detection and reporting, which could mean always in COM, uh, which is a link problem. Uh, the ability to maneuver rapidly, the ability to understand your environment. So when I talk about the network, fighting off of a network, the, the baseline of that is a sensor network uh, for both indications and warnings, uh, sensing you know, visually what's in the local environment, uh, what the RF environment's doing. We need to essentially flood the domain with that sensor network, uh, back it up now with that second layer of having a resilient communications network, whether it's through Dr. Tournier's backbone or through other means, to make sure that we can ground that data into CONUS, into the network. Uh, and so there are, without making this take too long, those are the basic technical requirements for what I think we're gonna be looking for, for the future of how are we going to develop a resilient decision-making sensor mesh communications data network that allows us to leverage defensive effects no matter what they might be. Derek, anything on that? I was really hoping he was going to say we were going to have a guardian with a ray gun protecting every satellite. <laughs> so he didn't say that. So what... Uh, Are you going to say that? Well, <laughs> we're relying on SSC to... No, so the... Uh, um, it, I, 
proliferation is our is our biggest defense, and then that that's how we that's how we plan on on really getting the resilience and the and the defense of our of our entire architecture. Right? We we uh, I I like to I'll I'll steal it from from SpaceX when they when they talk about Starlink. Right? We our satellites are cattle, not pets, and that's the way you have to look at it when you're talking about proliferated constellations. Each individual one you can't really care about. You have to care about the health of the whole herd, the health of the whole architecture. And so we have everything in place to make sure that, that we can maintain that resiliency and maintain that operations even if you, you start to lose individuals. So we don't, we don't go out, you know, we're not gonna try to, to protect indiv individual nodes. Now that said, obviously we have cyber protections in place to protect the entire architecture and the network. And we have a lot of the environmental sensing pieces that are in place to, to give us an idea of what's going on one of the key ones that, uh, for those of you that have been watching our solicitations, we put GPS situational awareness sensors on our, our satellites for those kind of things to, to make sure that we can kind of sense the, the environment. That's primarily looking at the terrestrial environment, but it's it's very similar type of thing that we look just to just to sense the threat the threat environment of the domain, and then we would provide those as data. Uh, to you know, to to the be proliferated through the rest of, of the space force and and for space command in their in their unified data library, so that everyone has this common operating picture of what the Leo environment looks like. That's really uh, as far as we're taking any of the defensive measures. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to move to some questions here, but I, I'll give you a, a a short period if you have anything to add from industry's perspective. I'll just say that one thing I really appreciate about General Salzman was that transparency and plain spokenness about what we're up against yeah. and our ability to yeah. keep having a conversation at a really, at that really kind of, um, I'll call it almost a, it's a really human level, right? It's something we've gotten comfortable with in all the other domains. And we've just been really reluctant to acknowledge what we're up against in space. But when we do acknowledge it and we talk about it in those kind of plain spoken terms, then we realize that we actually have the experience and the wherewithal to get after the problem. And so the more we continue the conversation that, that the chief has led off in the manner that he's led off, I think will empower us uh, collectively to get after the problem. So. Agreed, and uh, the transparency and the consistency with the messaging here today is, is fantastic for industry. We, a term I've heard used a lot in the last, call it two, three weeks, is uh, the field of dreams model for technology. If, if, if you build it, the DOD will come. and. Obviously, that's not an applicable model, but in space, <laughs> even more so, where <laughs> timelines are long, hardware is expensive, a production line is far more expensive than other domains. So uh, the consistency in the signaling, the consistency in the messaging, and the transparency uh, at all levels is really helpful to industry. Really well said. Well, let's open it up. If you have some questions, please raise your hand. Tell us who you are and direct your question, if you will. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll come here next. Hi, good morning. Uh, Steve Jordan Tomaszewski with the Aerospace Industries Association. Uh, question about supply chain. Um, I think we touched on this a little bit, but um, wondering what is your biggest supply chain challenge uh, you know, for, for government? Uh, what's stopping you from executing your programs? What, what's your biggest challenge? And then for industry, as you're scaling to you know, meet demands, um, especially with a lot of new space architectures, what, what, what is your top supply chain challenge right now? Thanks. Star Trekkers. No, integrated space specific components that have long lead times. So we want to get beyond the, the tyranny of long lead. Uh, and some of our, uh, some of the new space companies, uh, they have looked at how to integrate vertically and so that they are not beholden to outside suppliers. Uh, so Star Trekkers, reaction wheels, control moment gyros, um, and there's something else uh, that, that are just kind of eating our lunch with respect to timelines. If we can find a company who's figured out how to, to get past that, uh, oh, sorry, uh, thrusters. In some cases, thrusters. Really? Uh, I haven't noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> so so, so those, those integrated, specialized components where, where we have to plan years in advance and budget years in advance, that's where we want to get beyond. Yeah, I'll add that. So the other part I'll add to that is even on our short cycles where we have roughly 30 months order to orbit, what you think is going to be the a long pole in the tent of your supply on day one 
uh, tends to not be the long pole in the supply uh, midway through the program, which is what, what we found. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of components. And, uh, and, and the key thing is just to make sure that the market stays healthy with a lot of tier two, tier three providers. Post COVID, you know, during COVID, it was difficult just to even get resistors and things like that. Some of those components are now coming online and making it easier, but space-based crypto, uh, space radios, those are big, even solar panels are, are a big deal. Uh, all of this, and like I said, you, I, can't, I can't predict because we knew space-based crypto uh, would, would be an issue from day one on, uh, on our tranche one, but now we're, we're tracking some other ones that were not identified as the highest risk on the supply chain, such as propulsion. And so this is one of the things that you just constantly watch. Question right out here and then we'll have to break. First of all, thank you, gentlemen, for, for, for this very informative panel this morning. My name is Ruchika Tandon. I'm with the Air Forces and Space Association, the New Jersey Shooting Star Chapter. We're here at this table. I'd like to ask a question specifically for Lockheed Martin and for the United States Space Association. What is it that we're doing re regards to the space debris field that we have out there? With the amount of assets that you're putting out there, what percentage are we growing in terms of this debris field year, year over year or decade over decade? And what kind of steps are you taking to have these new assets not eventually be a part of our space debris field? Thank you, gentlemen. I think she said Lockheed Martin. So John, uh -huh. yeah, I'm pretty sure we'll be taking Jonathan, that one first. <laughs> Jonathan, you'll close us up on this. No, look, I think all of the industry associations uh, have to realize that and we as, as large companies uh, corporations take a leadership position in responsible use of space. Uh, and the systems that we put up with are, are we're committed to the consistent deorbiting. Just, you know, one of the things that uh, SDA and we have a lot of conversation about is we can take risks in mission, we can take risks in production. But one of the things we're very careful about is making sure that we can in fact leave the space as good as when we found it. And, and it's a challenge that we're gonna have to continue to wrestle with. I think it provides great opportunities though. I mean, we have uh, if you can do in-space production and in-space refueling, you can get after uh, a lot of these challenges. And so I think there's a tremendous opportunity that's probably about to present itself for those of us in industry. If you're paying attention, there's going to be a market for, uh, for keeping the environment clean in addition to taking responsible steps about how we architect and design the vehicles that we're putting up. Well, we've come to the end of this panel. I, to one, one, one quick, so we did, we did, uh, SDA just did release a special notice to our STEC BA, which is our open BA for ideas, to look for people that, there are a lot of companies out there that are uh, offering orbit maintenance services, and we want to find out just how real that is, and so we're, we're looking to, to put some studies out there to find out the efficacy of that model, because it would allow us then to take larger risk on some of our satellites so we could drop the price of them in the future. And so that's, that's one of the things we're looking at. I think that's something Mitchell Institute could get into and raise a little cash, I think. Maybe? I'm all for it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, we've come to the end of this panel and uh, really appreciate the uh, time you've given us uh, a great discussion. We're going to break in place for about 10 minutes and then we'll start our next panel. Thank you. Thank you.